All right, welcome to module 10.2, Pairing Genetics and Ecology to Uncover Key Insights about the Southern Hairy-Nosed Wombat. And today I'm going to introduce you to hairy-nosed wombats and then show you how we collected hair for genetics and then how we use genetic data to examine within population processes in continuous and in fragmented habitat. So hairy-nosed wombats are unique and magnificent. They are uh, the largest herbivorous burrower at about 26 kilos. They have a very low metabolic rate. It's roughly 50% of a placental mammal, meaning they're technically half dead. And they're more water efficient than camels. They have a long lifespan. They've been known to live at least 30 years in the wild. And at my study site, I've found them to live at least 18 years in the same area. And they live in warrens, which are interconnected burrow systems. And these warrens are so large that they can be seen on Google Earth. There are two species. There's the southern hairy-nosed wombat, which I'll be talking about today. And then there's the critically endangered northern hairy-nosed wombat that lives in central Queensland in two populations. And so um, to give you a little bit of background, there's um, Wombats are very prominent on the landscape. Uh, they make these huge warrens, and they're prominent in the minds of Australians as well as being one of the, of the top three mammals. But there's still a lot that we don't know about many aspects of their biology. And what we wanted to look at was within population processes. And these are mating system, social organization, and kin interactions. And in particular, what we wanted to know how altered dispersal would impact these processes and how that might lead to extinction. So our aims were to identify individuals and their movements by remote sampling of DNA using hair, and, that, and then to determine burrow and warren use, burrow sharing, genetic and relatedness structure, kinship, and pref preferential association and then to infer dispersal and determine social implications. And we wanted to do this for populations in continuous habitat, as well as for those experiencing pertur perturbation. And for this talk, that is demographic isolation from fragmentation of habitat. And here is uh, a warren. And what we did in the field was we used garden stakes, which we pounded into each side of a burrow entrance. And then we suspended double-sided sticky tape about the height, at about the height of a wombat. We then checked these tapes every morning. And then if um, they were hit by a wombat, we would take them down and replace them. So a hit wombat tape looks something like this. The follicles are large and juicy and contain gobs of DNA. So we could actually perform DNA extractions on single hairs in the field. Our main study site in continuous habitat was at Brookfield Conservation Park. Um, this is in the Murraylands of South Australia. And here we sampled twice a year, every burrow within about a one kilometer area. And we checked and replaced tapes daily for about a week, resulting in 7,000 opportunities for wombats to leave hair for this study. Back in the lab, we used 15 microsatellite loci and a sexing marker to generate what is essentially a unique genetic fingerprint for each individual, such that only two in a million wombats could be expected to share a genotype. And we found that hair taping is highly effective for capturing wombats. We detected 102 individuals between one and 44 times, which is equivalent to about a thousand captures in a capture mark recapture study. We found that um, the number of new individuals detected per night dropped off by around night fives, such that um, very few or no new new. Um, new wombats were detected. So in short, this shows that um, 
we're detecting most or almost all wombats that use the study area. All right, so this means that we can also look at space use because we detected these guys more than once. Uh, we found that warrens, which are denoted by the black dots in this figure, were used between one and five times. And we were able to calculate a warren use area for each individual, which, which extended to 7.8 hectares. And this um, was more effective than radio tracking in terms of um, in terms of that maximum hectare area. All right, we also found that dispersal is female biased. So this figure here shows the likelihood of being born locally. Males were more likely to have been local, born locally than females. Male pairs were significantly more related to each other than were female pairs. And males clustered at short, males at short geographic distances were more related to each other um, than females were. And zooming into the males, we get this, um, this pattern that shows that within about 100 meters, males, male relatives are, are hanging out. So basically within a warren. But females are doing something different. They're actually more related to individuals that are about 250 meters away, which is uh, roughly another uh, neighboring warren. And we suggest that this might indicate that breeding dispersal is going on. And that is dispersal by a female after she raises young. Um, so she may be bequeathing her burrow to her offspring um, before moving to a, another warren. This meant we could also look at um, association within warrens to identify wombat pairs that associated more than expected by chance. And we found that male pairs uh, were more um, associated more with each other than um, and were associated with relatives, male relatives, and females with non-relatives. So let me try that again. Males were associating with male relatives and females with, with non-related females. We could look at parentage. So we found 43 parent offspring pairs. They shared warrens, particularly the father sons. And the longevity of this father son relationship was um, really shown by more father son pairs being detected than any other type and a higher percentage significantly associated. All right, so that's a picture of what was happening in continuous habitat. So, um, so let's look now at um, a demographic isolation. And we had to first spend a lot of time um, sampling these potential isolated populations in fragmented habitat. And it turns out we ended up with one that had signatures of demographic isolation. And it was nowhere near as genetically depauperate as the, as the Northern hairy nosed Wombat. It was in the York Peninsula, actually on a piece of land owned by a macaroni company. And it's called Culpera. This is a um, two photos of the site. So in 1956, and in 2023, it, you know, really hasn't changed much in that time. It's a site surrounded by cropland. We found 73 wombats, and they were at high density, and there was pronounced warren and burrow fidelity. All right, so we found that the likelihood of being born locally didn't differ between the sexes. We found that, that male pairs were uh, similarly related as female pairs, and that females had the same trend of being more related to geographically close females um, as male pairs are. So again, here's males are doing pretty much the same thing as in continuous habitat. Female pairs are more related when they're geographically close, which is not what's happening at at our continuous site at Brookfield Conservation Park. For parentage, we found a strong tendency among parent offspring pairs to share warrens. There were significantly more mother-daughter pairs detected 
and twice as many mother-father offspring triads detected than in continuous habitat. So both of these are suggesting or showing that females immigrate at a slower rate from the site. And this makes sense because there's really nowhere to go. And coolly enough, we found that related females share burrows. And this is very different from what's happening in continuous habitat. In conclusion, in continuous habitat, males are phylopatric. This is very rare in mammals. They associate with male relatives, and this may indicate they're, that they're cooperating in defense of warrens, or it may be that they just preferentially tolerate each other. Females uh, um, disperse. This is very rare in mammals, and it may suggest that breeding dispersal is occurring. In fragmented habitat, dispersal was inhibited. They existed at high population density, and kin interactions were modified for females who preferred female relatives. So it may be that they're just tolerating each other, or it may be that they're cooperating. And certainly this fits into kin selection theory in that it may dampen the impact of sociality or enhance indirect fitness. All right, that's the story. Thank you. And this is my email address. Here are the modules for this course. And thanks to um, these entities that contributed to TSI.